are here together for quarantine youth group. I'm here in the church sanctuary. You are at home, uh, hopefully behaving, um, getting ready uh, to enjoy a good Bible study, maybe. We'll see. Uh, but tonight we're going to be talking about Daniel, as you can see on the, on the board. We're going to be talking about Daniel. We're going to look at chapters 1 through 17. But before we get into Daniel, I want to tell you real quick why uh, I feel I owe that to you, why we decided, or I decided, I mean I was the one who decided to not have in-person youth group any longer uh, and then we'll, until further notice. I mean we'll get back together eventually, but um, one, I just wanted us to focus on Bible study. I wanted us to focus on the Word, and I think you guys are up to the task. Uh, others may not feel that way about teenagers, but I do always have. I think you guys can handle uh, meat. You can handle uh, hard stuff. You don't need stuff to be spoon-fed to you. So uh, we're going to have some, hopefully some really good Bible studies together. Uh, but the other reason is... Um, yeah, when we get together for youth group, we're awfully close, uh, and we uh, don't need to be that close uh, like we have been. You know, on a Sunday morning, people are spread out, uh, and it's uh, a lot safer. But when we get for, for youth group, uh, it's like you get a bunch of teenagers together, and they become a huddled mass pretty quickly. And I don't want to be the one to bring any kind of... Uh, uh, unsafe uh, environment for you so we're just not going to meet until uh, such a time that it is safer uh, to meet and be that huddled mass that I know you all like to be uh, I know you're getting ready to go to school and uh, we'll see how that works out you know right now Indiana uh, according to uh, my understanding anyway is that Indiana is kind of a hot spot uh, for COVID so we're going to be diligent we're going to be careful and we're not going to tempt fate. That's all I'll say about that. Um, but we're going to look at Daniel chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles with you, get your Bibles out and look up Daniel chapter 1. We're going to look at just the first seven verses of Daniel chapter 1 tonight. I think it's a really cool story. Number one reason that I think it's a, a neat story is now Daniel was a prophet, right? We, we, we've seen his book in the Bible. We've skipped past his book in the Bible. We know some stories from Daniel because we went to Sunday school. We know about Daniel being in the lion's den, right? Um, we also know about his three friends, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. We usually say Abednego, but it's Abednego. And, and we, we know their stories. They were thrown into the fiery furnace and God saved them, right? Um, and that's about all we know <laughs> about Daniel. Uh, and the stories that are in that story, because we don't spend a lot of time um, in, in church or in Sunday school or in youth group talking about uh, the, the story behind Daniel. Uh, but Daniel uh, himself, the person, he was so much more than just some guy who wrote a book, all right? Uh, he was so much more than some guy who had some visions of the future. A lot of the end time prophecies uh, that we have of, of the end of the age come from the book of Daniel. And there's a lot there to, to steep in and a lot to, to study and learn from. Uh, but that's not where, really where I want us to go first. We'll get to that. But I want us to look at the life of this person named Daniel. And we're going to, we're going to get to know Daniel and his three friends uh, tonight, just a little bit, and we're going we're gonna to start seeing things through their eyes, all right? So if you, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to start reading in Daniel chapter 1. I'm just going to read the first few verses here, and then, uh, and then I'm going to uh, share something with you. But it says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, now he was the king of Judah, it says, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. So a foreign king, that's the first thing that we need to understand has happened in Daniel's life, okay? A foreign king invades. Now imagine you're going on about your life. You're just doing what you normally do. Uh, and uh, a, a, an army invades your homeland, okay? Uh, an army invades your, your homeland and, and sort of takes over. That's exactly what happens uh, to Daniel's homeland. 
He is an Israelite. He lives in Israel. And we'll learn here in a moment that he's probably nobility or maybe even of the royal family. Okay? He's, he's upper crust, Daniel is. He's educated, well-educated. He knows a thing or two about serving in a king's court. Um, this is Daniel. Uh, but this king comes in and takes over the land. He takes over Jerusalem. It says he besieged it. And you know what it means to besiege something? It means it wasn't just, hey, I'm coming to town and we've struck a deal and you guys are with me now. Uh, he, he surrounded that city. There was a war. They outlasted him. The city ran out of food. They had to give up. Okay? It, was, it was a violent takeover, a hostile takeover. Uh, is what happened here when Nebuchadnezzar comes in. And, and so in verse 2 it says, The Lord gave Jehoiakim of Judah into his hand. So we see right from the beginning whose idea is this. It's God. All right. So a foreign king invades, takes over your land. So again, we're looking at this through Daniel's eyes. This foreign king invades, takes over your land, and it was God's idea. God was in uh, the mix here of Nebuchadnezzar coming in and taking over Jerusalem. Now, what they don't tell you here in this little bit of the story is that Judah had been unfaithful. They were worshiping other gods, and God warned them. So on several occasions, he told them not to, but they did it anyway. And so he allows Nebuchadnezzar to come in and take over Jerusalem and, and to ransack Jerusalem. Uh, the, the house of God even there it says in verse 2 with some of the vessels of the house of God even and he brought them into the land of Shinar that's where Nebuchadnezzar is from to the house of his God so all of the uh, can you imagine you know I'm here in our sanctuary and we've got our altar uh, we've got our offering plates, we've got the cross, we've got the Bible, we've got the baptistry, we've got our hymn books we've got our Bibles and a foreign king comes in and invades Poseyville and takes over and comes in and grabs a bunch of our religious wear, things we use for worship, and takes it back to his own country and puts it in his place where he worships. A different God, mind you. But he grabs our baptistry, the thing we use to baptize people, and he puts it in his temple where he worships his God and he uses it there. Uh, in, in effect, profaning it, turning it into a tool of darkness instead of a tool for worship, right? And so that's exactly what happens with some of the items that are in the temple where Daniel would go to worship. And so the items are taken from the temple and they're put into the, the, the house of, of Nebuchadnezzar's God, place the vessels into the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, this is a man who is a slave of Nebuchadnezzar, who has no other life, he has no wife, he has no children, he only lives to serve Nebuchadnezzar, to bring some of the people of Israel, some, not all, because when you take over a land, this is what they would do. They'd come in and they'd take over a land, and they would leave most of the people there, but they would subjugate them. They would turn them into slave labor. And so they would work in that land, and they would work the harvest. They would send uh, a lot of their grain back to Shinar, back to Nebuchadnezzar. They would have enough just to live off of, but all of their profit would go to the king. Uh, and that's how you took over, and that's how you were able to control vast amounts of territory. And then you would, put, uh, you would take the, the proper king back with you to where you came from, and you'd put a puppet king in his place, a, a king who would answer to you, and you would only... And then, you would, and then you'd be able to land, uh, rule that land with just uh, minimal military effort. You would leave a garrison or two there uh, to control that area, and you could control that whole land because you had a puppet king who would do whatever you wanted them to do, right? And so uh, that is exactly what King Nebuchadnezzar does. And, but he brings some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility there in verse 3, and then in verse 4, this is the thing I want you to pay close attention to. In verse 4, he says, Youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So he grabs all of the treasures of the temple, and then he grabs 
all of the teenagers who work in the, in the royal palace and who are of the nobility. He grabs all the teenagers, the smart ones, mind you. It says these are the ones who uh, they, had, they had good uh, complexions. They were handsome to look at. Uh, they were smart. Okay, they were really sharp. Uh, they had all kinds of wisdom. Uh, they understood how to, how to learn. They weren't just like, they didn't know what they knew. They, they, these people were, were lifelong learners, these teenagers. And they were good enough to stand in the king's palace. And then he decided he was going to teach them the literature and language of his own people. Okay? So these are smart teenagers. Daniel is but a teenager at this time. Okay? Like you. He's, he's just probably uh, at, at best 16, 17 years old uh, when he's taken into captivity back to a, a foreign land that he's never heard of. He's never been there. He's a probably maybe even heard of these people, but uh, th to think that they would come and take over and then kidnap him and take him to a land that is not his own uh, is a frightening thing. But this is what Daniel is experiencing. And then in verse 5, the king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate. He wanted these young people that he has kidnapped, he wanted them to eat the food that he ate. Okay, so there's, this, there's a spiritual lesson we'll get to in, in a moment, but this idea that he wanted these young people to eat the same food that he ate and, and to, to keep that in mind. It says they were to be educated for three years. So they were going to eat the king's food, and they were going to go to school for three years. Now, that doesn't sound like too bad of a captivity, does it? To be taken away from your homeland, yeah, that's sad. But you get to eat the king's food, and you get to go to school for three years. That's, that's, a, that's a pretty sweet idea. If, if, I mean, compared to, to slave labor, which the people who were left in, in Israel, they have to work hard and send all of their profit to the king, and they never go anywhere. They're just workers. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're slaves. Now, they're held against their will. They're captives. So essentially, they're slaves too, and they're forced to work in the king's court. Um, but they get to eat the king's food, and they get, to, they get to go to school, and they get to learn. They probably get all the, all the good clothes too, right? And among these, in verse 6, were Daniel. I'm going to write his name here again. Daniel, and then another young man named <clears throat> excuse me, Hananiah, and then another young man named Mishael, and then another young man. I just lost it, sorry. <laughs> Named Azariah, sorry. Azariah. And if you've read on ahead, then you know that these three, these three guys right here, they eventually have their names changed, as does Daniel in the next verse. Uh, and they're all of the tribe of Judah, okay? These young men are from the tribe of Judah, and it says, and the chief of the eunuchs, that would be Ashpenaz, that guy that we talked about earlier, he gave them names. Daniel, he called Belteshazzar. Now, we'll get to that next week. We'll talk about what, what Belteshazzar means. Uh, but Daniel, that name, that name Daniel means that, I'm going to erase this, God rules me. Can you imagine having that name? God's my boss. That's, that's what his name means. Danielle, God is my ruler. He's my king. He's the one that tells me what to do. And Daniel, of course, in the rest of the, the story, uh, lives up to that name quite well. But the, the king... And the guy who works for the king want to change Daniel's name to Bel to Shazar. And we'll get to that next week. But then Hananiah, whose name is changed to Shadrach, 
okay, from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That's these three guys. Hananiah's name is, is changed to Shadrach, but his name means God is gracious. And we know following his story that that is exactly what God proved to be for Hananiah, that God would be gracious to him. And then Mishael, I love this name. It took me a while to, to find the source that gave me a good uh, meaning for this name. But Mishael means nobody like my God. Don't you love that phrase? Ain't nobody like my God. Nobody like my God. It doesn't mean nobody likes him. It means there's no one like him. Nobody is like my God. Nobody like my God. And it's that, oh, you've got gods, and especially we'll learn about this in the book of Daniel. They were, cho they were forced, forced to worship other gods. At least they tried to force them, and that's why these guys got in trouble. It's like, you've got gods, but ain't nobody like my God. And he stuck to his guns. We'll see that in his story. And then we have Azariah. And again, such a fitting name. God has helped. And right here, in the names, the meaning of the names of these four guys who are ripped from their homeland and they're put into uh, indentured servitude in a foreign land. God rules me. God is my, I, I'm not here to serve you. I might be having to serve you in the flesh, but I have a God who rules over me. Nobody can tell me what to do but him. And if I do something for you, it's because my God told me to. And if I serve you, it's because my God asked me to. And then when they ask him to do something that God tells him not to do, Daniel disobeys because he doesn't serve the king. He serves God. And he gets in trouble for it. Okay? But God rules. And all these three guys, they get in trouble because they honor God's rule before anyone else. And this is the same calling on our lives, and especially you as teenagers. There are so many distractions, so many temptations in the world for you as a young person that say, you should do this, you need to do this, you need to do this, you need to do this. You do only what God allows you to do. You obey the laws of the land as long as they do not uh, conflict with what God has asked you to do. You know, it's interesting, uh, you know, I'm here by myself, so I don't have a, a mask on. But if there were other people here, I would have a mask. Do you know why? Not because I am afraid of what will happen if I don't wear my mask. That's not it at all. It's because the governor of this land has asked us to wear masks when we're together. So I'm going to wear a mask. It's that simple. Now, when I'm up on the, on the pulpit on a Sunday morning and I'm away from everyone, I'll take it off so people can hear me. But when I come back down and mingle with everyone, I'm going to put it back on because my governor asked me to. Now, if God stepped in and he said, David, I don't want you wearing that mask, then I'd have to look at the governor and I'd have to say tough noogies because I have to obey my God. But here's the kicker. My God has not asked me. <laughs> to not wear a mask. And I'll just say this about masks, because I think it applies to what we're learning tonight. I may not be, and you may not be convinced that that mask is actually helping us all that much. I don't know that you can prove that that mask keeps you uh, from getting sick, but that's immaterial. Because I know for a fact that that mask ain't hurting you. It's not hurting you to wear a mask. The only reason we refuse to wear masks and obey the governor's edict is because we don't want anybody to tell us what to do. And that's a heart issue in us. That's not, a, that's not a, an authority issue. That's not a freedom issue. That's a heart issue in us. Now, I know some of you might be watching this thinking, oh, Pastor David's gone to Medlin, and, and that's just not right. You know, and maybe your parents might think I'm crazy, too. Give me a call. We'll talk about it. 
I've got some good scriptures in Romans where Paul teaches the exact same thing. If it ain't going to hurt anybody, just do it. We need to be all things to all people. All right. I've gone too far. I know. Let's, let's back it up a little bit. But the next name, God is gracious. God rules me. God is gracious. God is going to be there for you. If you will trust him, if you will walk in him, if you will obey him, God will be there for you. You know why? Because ain't nobody like him. No one. This gods that we're going to learn about in, in the book of Daniel uh, in the coming weeks, they don't compare. They don't compare to Yahweh. They don't hold a candle to him. And, and we know he's the helper because these three guys, they end up getting thrown in the fiery furnace. A furnace, as we'll find out, uh, is so hot that it actually killed the people who threw them in. That's how hot the furnace was. And then the king looks down there in the furnace and he sees, he said, wait a second, I thought we threw three people in there. They're like, yeah, you're right. Well, why do I see four? Because ain't nobody like their God. He shows up. Their God shows up. Their God helps. Their God's full of, full of grace for them. Why? I would suggest to you that all of this is contingent upon this. Who do you serve? Bob Dylan sang a song, you got to serve somebody. You got to serve somebody. You're either going to serve the Lord or you're going to serve the devil. You got to serve somebody. And if you will serve God, if you will make that your aim, I'm going to do what God asked me to do. I'm going to be God's person. I'm not going to worry about what culture tells me to do. I'm not going to worry uh, about what friends tell me to do. I'm not going to worry about uh, what, you know, what, what even, and, and here's, you know, it gets confusing sometimes, but I'm not even going to worry about what I tell me to do. I'm a poor judge of myself. I do things wrong and I think I'm right. I do things, I think I'm, just, I'll, I'm justified in it. And it takes the Holy Spirit to come and, and teach me, you know what, David? You don't quite have it right. You're messing up on some things. We have a God. If we'll choose to, to follow his rule and authority in our life, he's going to pour out grace for our mistakes, grace to protect us, grace to watch over us, grace to direct us. And he's going to show up and he's going to help you. And he will prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there ain't nobody like your God, Jehovah. Amen? All right. So next week we're going to get into um, uh, the rest of chapter 1 here. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Uh, but it, it is, and it's, it's basically go time, right? God's, God gave them these names. The, the king tried to give them different names. We'll talk about what those different names mean. But Daniel chooses to be true to his name. He says, my, my ruler, my authority, my king is God. And we'll talk about that next week. But let me say a prayer for us, and then I'll say goodbye to you. Uh, I miss you guys, and we will get back together eventually. Don't worry. Um, but I know school's coming up. Uh, you're getting ready for that. And so I want to say a prayer for your school year. I know next week uh, the uh, basic Sunday school class is planning on going around to the schools and, and saying some prayers over the schools uh, just for your school year. Uh, and so we're excited to be able to pray for you uh, and with you. I'm hoping you'll pray with me as you get prepared for school. And no matter what this school year holds for you, uh, we don't know what tomorrow holds. We never have, actually. Uh, we're just more aware of that these days than we used to be. And you may go to school for a week and they cancel it. I don't know what they're going to do. You may go to school all year uh, and have to wear a mask all day. But you're going to survive. You're going to do okay. Uh, you may go uh, to some kind of weird hybrid thing. I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Uh, but God does. And he promises to be with you. He'll be with all of us that whole time. And so we prepare ourselves for what we think may happen. You know, we, we do our best. Um, but we don't lose heart. And we don't give in to fear. And that's going to be my prayer for you. So would you pray with me now? God in heaven, we thank you so much that as we've learned in this, this just the first seven 
verses of this chapter in Daniel, we've learned a great deal about who you are. And uh, we've learned more about who Daniel is and, and his three friends. But uh, God, we want you to teach us about who we are in you. Help us to find our hope in you. Help us to be like Daniel, who will choose your rule and authority in our lives uh, over any others. And that we can submit to you. And that means that choosing your rule and authority even over our own rule and authority in our own lives. That we have yielded to your, uh, your sovereignty in our lives. That if you tell us to go right, we go right. If you tell us to go left, we go left. And if you tell us to, to listen to our teachers and do what our teachers say, then we listen to our teachers and do what our teachers say. If you tell us to listen to our parents, okay, we'll listen to our parents. Help us to be followers of you. That means we go where you go, we say what you say. And God, I pray that as we're able to do that, especially these young ones going into... Uh, this upcoming school year. I've got uh, even some seniors getting ready to go to college. Uh, it's big time stuff. But they don't go alone. And they never will be alone. They go with you. They go in that knowledge that you are a God who is gracious. And that there's no one like you, God. And you're a God who helps. And so I ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior. Amen. All right. Love you guys. Go in peace.